In November of 1120, King Henry I of England thought he had squared away a much needed peace, only to have the celebration marred by a tragedy that had long-reaching consequences. On this episode of Footnoting History, we're talking about Henry I, his son William, and the sailing of the White Ship. Hey everyone, Christine here, ready to take you back to the 12th century for an event that broke a king's heart and change the trajectory of the medieval English monarchy. So basically, a topic that nobody is surprised I'm the one covering. To kick things off, let's start by meeting King Henry I of England. He was born in England in the mid-11th century, in either 1068 or 1069. He grew up to become the third Norman, as in from Normandy, the region of northwestern modern France, King of England. The first was his father, whose name you might recognize, William the Conqueror. Many of us might think that it was fairly obvious who came next as king after William the Conqueror, his eldest son, right? Because that's how these things go. However, in 1087, when William the Conqueror died, it was not yet a completely solidified and unquestioned given that the eldest son would be the next king. At the time of his death, William the Conqueror had three living legitimate sons. His eldest, Robert, had control of the Duchy of Normandy. His second son, William Rufus, was the one who became King William II of England. While our Henry, the final living son, received a large amount of money which he later used to establish himself. Eldest brother Robert by no means thought it was okay that his younger brother William became King of England. And he showed his disapproval by fighting with William II for a large part of his reign. Eventually, though, Robert decided to go off east on crusade, and William II continued to rule in England with Henry on his good side. But even this would not leave things stable for long, as in August of 1100, England had a new king, again. Why? Because William II was severely, or, I mean, I guess I should say, fatally wounded while on a hunting trip, during which our Henry was present. Since he was local when William died, without heirs of his own body, I must note, so William had no children, and his other brother Robert was still en route back from the crusade, Henry was able to hustle and take the crown. On August 5, 1100, Henry, the youngest surviving son of William the Conqueror, was officially crowned King Henry I of England. And although he fades from our narrative here, I don't want you to think that I'm neglecting the fate of elder brother Robert, who was twice passed up for the English crown. He was a thorn in Henry's side, just as he was in William II's side, until he ended up taken into custody a few years into Henry's reign. Robert would spend the remainder of his life, that's almost 30 years, locked away in a castle. Not brutally treated, but definitely held captive. So what does all of this have to do with an event that took place in 1120? So stick with me, because we are building our house of cards. When Henry I became king, he was in his early 30s. He'd watched dynastic squabbles and taken part in them. And he'd also witnessed diplomacy and a variety of methods of ruling used by both his father and his brother. He is said to have had dark hair and a tendency to be informal in his speech. He could read and write, which was not a prerequisite for rulers in this time period, and he loved women. No, no, really, he loved women. In fact, he loved so many women that he ended up with about two dozen illegitimate children, many of which we know the names and fates of. But, because they were illegitimate, as in not born from a union of Henry and a wife, they could not inherit the crown. So, what he really would need was a legitimate heir. If there's one thing a king needs if he wants an heir that's legitimate, it's a queen. Right? So, that's our next step. Henry was no exception. In November of 1100, only a few months after his coronation, Henry married Matilda of Scotland and had her crowned queen. Matilda was the orphan daughter of King Malcolm III and Queen Margaret of Scots. Although she was raised in a convent, and it was questioned whether or not that meant she could marry, 
it was determined that she had not taken vows, and so it was allowed. She was also a descendant of Edmund Ironside, one of the kings of England from before the Normans came over. Marrying her not only provided Henry with a consort and mother for his future heir, but also helped him strengthen his position, because her Anglo-Saxon blood and his Norman blood would be joined together in their children, and, he hoped, help everybody to view the conquering Norman dynasty as more legitimate in England. Matilda did provide that heir. Actually, she and Henry had two children. First, there was a daughter named Matilda, just like her mom, born in February of 1102. And then, in 1103, the heir came, a son named William. Henry didn't waste much time before he planned his daughter's future. By 1110, the young princess was no longer a presence in England. Her father had arranged for her to marry Henry V, who was at the time King of Germany and was about to become Holy Roman Emperor. He was also well over a decade her senior. After she spent several years at his court, their marriage was formalized in 1114, and thus a union of political alliance was forged. William's marriage would be political as well, but it would not occur officially until 1119. William's wife was Matilda of Anjou. Okay, so there are approximately 7 billion Matildas in this time period. Yes, I made that number up, but it is still true that it often feels like every woman in the 12th century nobility was named Matilda. So just stick with me on this. Matilda of Anjou was the daughter of Falk, Count of Anjou. As I said, this marriage was politically strategic for Henry. To elaborate on what that means, much like Henry had gotten embroiled in the battles between his two elder brothers over control of England and Normandy, he was facing the same sort of contentions in his own rule. Although now it was himself, and of course his son, against another William, often called William Cleto. This other William was our William's cousin and our Henry's nephew, as he was the son of Robert. I know, this is a bit of a family tree thing here, but you'll remember Robert, the eldest of Henry's brothers, and the one who had launched all those attacks against William II and was now going to end up languishing in a castle. So this is his son, Robert's son, William Cleto. The proverbial apple, as they say, does not fall far from the tree. Cleto was aided by both King Louis VI of France, and, yes, Falk of Anjou. That is, until Henry managed to muscle Falk into changing sides and forming the marriage alliance between their two children. With the marriage bringing Falk to his side, he still now had Louis and William Cleto to deal with, which he did, of course, because you can't just let that go. In August of 1119, with his son accompanying him, Henry defeated Louis in battle, and the victory led to Henry and Louis eventually entering into peace negotiations. Ultimately, by the end of 1120, Henry succeeded in seeing Louis VI disavow any support for William Cleto's claims and accept Prince William's homage for Normandy instead. So here, Louis has been defeated and decides, okay, you know what, I'm not going to support William Cleto trying to take over from Henry I. I'm going to accept the prince as the person in charge in Normandy instead. This is great. At this moment, Henry believes that he has secured the peace with France that would last. The fighting would stop. Cleto's claims to Normandy and England would not find any support among those with influence. And finally, Henry could relax a bit. Yeah, okay, sure he could, right? Come on, here we go. On November 25th, 1120, Henry, William his son, and their entourages were ready to return to England. The mood was festive, and some partied harder than others. Henry set sail for England from the port of Barfleur with some of his retinue first, while William and many others were going to sail on a different ship, recently refitted, and the one whose name is in the title of this episode, We Have Come to the White Ship. We have reached the event that caused me to do this episode and to have it go live in November so that if you listen to it right away, you can hear it in time for the anniversary. So maybe when the 25th comes around, you'll spare them all a little thought. 
So although Henry, and others like his nephew Stephen, tuck that name away because he's going to come up again later, they were offered the journey on the white ship too, but they chose not to go, and they went off on another vessel. Unlike his father and his cousin Stephen, William, who was very much enjoying himself that day, did decide to take the white ship. Some of the people who accompanied him on this very crowded voyage were his half-sister and half-brother, so two of Henry's many illegitimate children, as well as the sister of the aforementioned cousin Stephen. The ship was overcrowded with rambunctious, excited revelers, and those who were partaking in far too much of the drink were not limited to the traveling nobility and royalty. The crew was just as guilty of over-imbibing as the people they were charged with ferrying to England. That is not good. When the white ship finally set sail, it was evening, and it didn't make it very far. The ship was barely out of the harbor when it struck a rock that caused it to flounder and sink, taking almost everyone aboard with it. Everyone I mentioned above, William, that next king of England, his half-brother, his half-sister, his cousin, who was Stephen's sister, all gone, with little chance for many of the bodies to be recovered. Just like that, the happiness and joy turned to complete and utter devastation. Stories would circulate almost immediately, with a variety of details emerging, though of course, as they traveled down to us through many centuries, some might be more accurate than others. There is a story that William was put into a smaller boat and could have been saved, except he could hear his sister crying for help, and when he turned around his small boat, he was overtaken by shelter seekers and they all died anyway. Another story says that there was only one survivor and that he might have been a butcher. Still another one points out, and this one is rather funny, although it's really not a funny situation at all, that the real reason William's cousin Stephen was not on the ship was not just because it was overcrowded and he didn't feel like it, but because he suffered from diarrhea. I'm so sure that that's the tale he hoped would circulate about him for almost a thousand years. But there it is. It's one of those things that when you read, you don't really forget. Ultimately, though, the fact of the matter is that regardless of what happened after the ship hit the rock, almost every life aboard it was ended that night. Many families would never see their loved ones again, and King Henry I lost not just one, but multiple children, all of which he had no reason to think he wouldn't see shortly when he left France. This could be, if you wanted to dub it as such, the Titanic of the 12th century. The tragedy of the white ship sent ripples of shock through Western Europe. In one night, the future of Henry's dynasty and the person who cemented it together with his much-desired peace, went from celebrating to deceased. It was a blow that hit as hard as you could possibly imagine, and Henry had no choice but to deal with it, and that meant taking action, which is what he spent the next several years doing. Of course, with William gone, Henry needed a new heir. That is to say, he needed a new, legitimately born son. Though by now, he was what we would call middle-aged, he had so many children already that it was not out of the realm of possibility that he could achieve this. However, at this point, Henry had been widowed for a few years, as his wife, Matilda of Scotland, that's his William and Matilda's mother, passed away in 1118. Now, obviously, he needed another bride, and that bride came in the form of Adeliza, daughter of the Count of Levant, who was significantly younger than Henry at the time of their marriage which, therefore, made her hopefully perfect for providing a new son. Alas, this would not happen. Despite what were no doubt their best efforts, no children would come from this union. Meanwhile, the peace disintegrated. The marriage between Prince William and Folk of Anjou's daughter had amounted to nothing since he was dead, and the young widow had only really survived because she journeyed on a different ship from her husband. She eventually returned to her father's care, only to become a nun, and later rise to the position of abbess. Now, for Louis VI, he was also no longer obligated to uphold their peace, because the man who paid him homage for Normandy was gone. What happened next will surprise approximately 0% of my listeners. Both Louis VI and Folk of Anjou once again began to support William Clito. 
Tensions rose, conflict reignited, and Henry was once again pitted against the very same people he had celebrated establishing peace with on the eve of his son's death. And certainly, Louis VI was not sitting idle while Henry was worrying about securing the succession. Eventually, he married one of his relatives to William Cleto, which, as you all know, is an important political move to seal connections. Furthermore, William's fortunes took a turn for the better when he benefited from the murder of the Count of Flanders by being chosen as his replacement. Now he had the support of the King of France and a nice new title of his own. Not that this meant that he wasn't still interested in, you know, encroaching on Henry I's territory, because he still was. In addition to working with a rival claimant to Flanders to undermine William Cleto's authority and bring him down, Henry sought an alliance that would help him. Oh, and right, he still needs that heir. So where does that bring us? Anybody? Okay, it means enter Matilda. It just so happened that during this period, his daughter Matilda, who we last saw being married off to the Holy Roman Emperor, was widowed and without children. In this, Henry saw an opportunity. He welcomed his daughter, who by now styled herself as Empress Matilda, back to his court. First, he sought to firm up the succession of the English throne. That's right, everybody. Here we are. It's the 1120s, and I am going to tell you that a king wants to name his daughter as the heir to the throne. Although there were, as you can imagine, some strong opinions that said he could not choose Matilda as his heir, Henry and his own supporters won the day. And in January of 1127, Henry succeeded in having his court swear to uphold Matilda and her right to succeed him as what would be Queen of England. Among those who took this oath of support were Matilda's cousin Stephen and her half-brother Robert. It appeared in that moment like the next ruler of England could be a queen and not a king. With the succession sorted, Henry's next move was to give Matilda a new husband. And he used this opening to secure, of course, a theme throughout this whole episode, another alliance. Here he turned to somebody you may recall from another few minutes ago, Falk of Anjou, the same frenemy who had married his daughter to Prince William shortly before the White Ship tragedy. But this time around, it was Henry's daughter marrying Falk's son, Geoffrey. Seriously, they got along and became enemies so often over the years that it was like a yo-yo. At one point, after Prince William's death ended the marriage of Falk's daughter and Henry's son, Falk married a different daughter to Henry's enemy, William Cleto. Talk about a change, right? Only this marriage was dissolved when Henry had it forced out based on consanguinity. That is to say, he got the church to say that Falk's daughter and William Cleto were too closely related for the marriage to be sanctioned. Now, a few years after that, He's arranging his own family ties with Falk again, which would prevent him from returning to the side of William Cleto and Louis VI and help, he hoped, Falk remain on his own side. I really love crazy royal dynastic history, and that's why we end up with these strange, confusing back and forths in all of my episodes. But anyway, Matilda's new pairing meant that she went from being married to an emperor to marrying the son of a count, and a young one too, because he was about a decade younger than her and only approaching his mid-teens at the time. It's hard to imagine that she was too excited about this perceived downgrade, but nevertheless it was negotiated to happen, and happen it did. In June of 1128, Matilda and Geoffrey married, and shortly thereafter, Geoffrey's father Falk set off east where he would become King of Jerusalem, allowing Geoffrey to take his place as Count of Anjou at a young age. Now, okay, another deep breath for Henry, because he's making headway, again. Now he just has to deal with William Cleto constantly popping up and causing him trouble, right? Or does he? Because it turned out, he didn't. All the worries and preparation and machinations of Henry and his adversaries that they did going back and forth between William Cleto and Henry I and all these things suddenly stopped mattering. Because only about a month after Matilda's political marriage to Geoffrey, William Cleto died. 
he had sustained wounds in battle during a rebellion that broke out, not without Henry's encouragement, in Flanders. And just like that, poof, the thorn in Henry's side was gone. It's crazy how these things happen, isn't it? One minute, a person is alive and they're rattling around him to try and overthrow you, and the next minute he's gone and everything falls apart. I'd like to be able to tell you that, from this point on, everything was settled. The death of William Cleto removed the biggest competition that Henry had for his throne and position on the continent. And it also gave him and Louis VI no reason to remain at odds. Meanwhile, Matilda, his lone legitimate heir and intended successor, had not only entered into a second marriage, but also had declared support from most of the important and influential persons in her father's realm. That should have all been solid, right? Well, that must be why when people talk about the women who ruled England in their own right, so much time is spent on Queen Matilda of the 12th century. Except that doesn't happen. When people talk about women who ruled England in their own right, that is to say who didn't act as regent or were not just queens because they married a king who had all the power, Matilda's never in the discussion. The ones we typically hear about have names like Mary, Elizabeth, Anne, and Victoria. So then, what went wrong? All seemed like it was going according to plan in the years after the death of William Cleto. Matilda's marriage to Geoffrey of Anjou was anything but peaceful and serene. Yet, while Henry I was still alive, they had two sons together, Henry in 1133 and Geoffrey in 1134, with a third son, William, coming shortly after Henry I's death. Then the couple found common ground enough to enter into a disagreement with King Henry I, regarding castles that they believed belonged to them as part of Matilda's dowry. What this meant was, when Henry I passed away in December of 1135, following a brief illness that may or may not have had something to do with eating a bunch of lamprey eels, he was not on great terms with Matilda, and she was not present for his death. This lack of proximity to events put her at a great disadvantage when it came to claiming her spot as the rightful Queen Matilda of England, a disadvantage that would dictate the actions of the remainder of her life, because somebody else struck first. That someone was her cousin Stephen. Stephen, the man who I mentioned was with the royal party at the time of the white ship's sinking, and who had been among the first to swear his support and fidelity to Matilda as Henry's successor. Before Matilda could claim her crown, he took it for himself. Stephen managed to achieve a coronation mere weeks after the old king's death, an action that Matilda did not take lightly, and one which sent the country into decades of war so topsy-turvy that they are often called the Anarchy. It wasn't until the 1150s that the Anarchy came to a true conclusion when Stephen was dead. But it was not Matilda who was wearing the crown in the end, it was her son, as King Henry II. Yes, many of you have heard of him mentioned in lots of my episodes because, can't help it, I love him and everything I do about medieval England tends to come back to him. Nevertheless, as you can guess, Matilda, who, by the way, was hardly a perfect person herself, never did have a proper, lasting reign as queen, nor did she have a peaceful life, for she spent much of it fighting Stephen for the crown that her father had intended her to wear. All of Henry's best laid plans were for naught. They did nothing to prevent a similar situation of familial fighting over the crown from when he was growing up. So at the end of all of this, the only thing that we can do is wonder, what might have happened had his son William not partied too hard with his friends and chosen to take the white ship instead of sailing with his father? This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.